Really? Really? On that night of all nights, you had to do that again? Good morning to you. Good Monday morning. I'm Dayon Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates that I hope you'll also check out. Kings 2, Penguins 1. Shouldn't have been the story. Really. Shouldn't have come close to being the story. But the way in which this current team loses was going to supersede any and all warm and fuzzy stuff that had occurred all day long. And it did. It did. And I was in there, and I felt it. People were leaving just disgusted because this outcome was every bit as disgraceful as the pregame ceremony to retire Yarmir Yager's number 68 was, wow, just wow. I'm not even going to give you a good adjective for it. All I've got is wow. And I'll get to more on that, I promise, after the break. But what built this franchise's legacy, what a lot of the individuals who were there to Yager's left and right, what they built was a foundation of excellence from which all of them, even Mario, even Mario benefited. Because as we'd see, even once Mario was forced to retire, you know, the Stanley Cups kept coming. And to see this current team occasionally looking as if, I don't know, half the roster, maybe more of it, just flat out isn't invested or has been put together so incorrectly or is being coached so incorrectly that nothing overrides it. I, I, I've got examples galore from this game alone. Sid scores the only goal. Why? Because of course he does. It's what he does. He scores the only goal or goals. The supporting cast will generate some fun east to west passing. It won't result in anything and didn't. The bottom six barely exists. If it weren't for Lars Eller, they wouldn't exist at all. But instead of recalling how last summer Kyle Dubas and Mike Sullivan both talked about how the bottom six would be populated by gritty guys who are tough to play against. And, and you know, you're probably picturing the same thing I was back then, and that was all great. A whole bunch of Brandon Tanev, let's have that. That could make a difference. No, they brought in just a whole bunch of nothing and people who didn't really fit any role in one direction or the other, meaning offense or defense. They just weren't good at either of them. And they definitely weren't remotely physical or hard to play against. Same goes for the defense core. Up, down, and sideways. Not physical, not hard to play against. And yeah, you know, I, I get that even talking about physicality makes you sound like you've just time transported here from 1975 or something, but it's still part of the game and it still wins and it definitely wins in the playoffs. I'll ask you very quickly, top of your head, which team that the Penguins have faced recently looked the most to you? like one that was going to win in the playoffs. Yeah, the Panthers, right? Of course. Well, this team goes into this game seven points out of a playoff spot and with, let's not pretend this isn't part of it, all this pageantry and all these superstars and alumni and Mario and Yager and all these other champions, Ron Francis and Ulf Samuelson and Joey Mullen, Hall of Famers, Craig Patrick, you have a crowd there that's super into it. Three hours beforehand, they were super into it. The line to get into the building, at least the one that I saw on Fifth Avenue, was two blocks long because they were afraid they'd miss something if they didn't line up early enough. Big, big game, right? Following a big, big event. Maybe try something a little different. 
Kings were playing their third game in four days. The Kings played on Saturday in Boston and had to beat their own brains out, battling hard enough to come back and win in overtime. Make an exception or an addendum to the strategy and say, hey, listen, we're going to do something that's going to be just designed to beat this opponent. We're going to go out there and we're going to hit a little bit, just a little bit. You don't have to lose your minds. don't have to get out of position, but go and finish some checks. Believe it or not, that's actually happened in the past under Sullivan. It's usually been in playoffs, but it's it's got a precedent. This is when it should have been used. Instead, they put in this Well, the first thing they do is they send down Jonathan Gruden, and I don't want to make that sound like some bigger deal than it is, but Gruden goes down to the AHL before the game. Gruden is the guy, for those of you who follow Wilkes-Barre Scranton, that those Penguins will send over the boards when they need to protect a late lead. He's got some grit to him, uh, responsible type player. He goes down and they put in this Waiver pickup from Washington, whose name I've already forgotten. He's five foot six officially. He looks like he's the size of one of my legs. He's supposed to have all kinds of offensive skill, has never done anything to show that in the NHL. And in fact, in this game, made two backward passes out of the Pittsburgh zone back to the neutral zone because maybe he was just trying to fit in. He had no business suiting up for this game. They had no business having him make his debut in this game. They had him out there with three minutes left in a tie game on a power play. Not making that up. In fact, he was out there for the shorty that cost the Penguins the game. Because of course they would lose on a shorthanded goal. And as the Kings came up ice, Chris Letang was back in... The right spot, awaiting what should have been, at the very worst, a two-on-two. Only Riley Smith decided to take a half-hearted, one-handed poke check and stop. I'm talking about coming to a cold stop in front of Andrzej Kopitar, future first ballot Hall of Famer, because that was going to stop Kopitar from springing the other guys. You've never seen pardon my bluntness here, something so dumb from an individual on a hockey rink, it's certainly not in some time. Kopitar Springs, Adrian Kempe, who probably has about 500 career goals against the Penguins already in his career. Kempe comes in, takes a low shot that slides, and I do mean slides, under Tristan Jari's inexplicably raised goal stick because You can't have a late, tight situation without expecting Jari to cough one up. Sorry, it's just true. I asked Sullivan, who appeared to be in a pretty bad mood after the game, why why not do something to wear the opponent down instead of making it so easy on them? Mike, was there anything more that could have been done to wear down an opponent that played a pretty tough game yesterday in Boston? Well, I mean, listen. We all play. We all play back to backs. We all play tough games. That's just the nature of the league we're in. You know, we could we have spent a little bit more time in the offensive zone and maybe you know force them to expend more energy defending us. Yes, I thought we could have as a group. You can kind of tell he wanted no part of that question, which is fine because I really don't want any part of that particular answer. That's not good enough. It's not good enough to just say, let's have some sustained attack zone time. This team does not have people capable of attack zone time other than Sid and the rest of the top line. That's it. Nobody else cycles. Nobody else wears anybody down. That's a personnel issue. That's a strategy issue. That's a roster issue. And let's not forget, that's a player issue. This was lousy. And yet somehow... Somehow, even though it was in such stark contrast to what had preceded it, it just felt so bleeping appropriate, didn't it? When we come back, J1Q. Today's 
J1Q comes from Todd, who says, DK, that ceremony was fantastic. The Penguins are all class. Yarmer Yager's remarks, wow. His way of paying tribute back to the city and the franchise was brilliant. Is there any doubt left about how he feels about Pittsburgh? Calling the city, quote, my second home, end quote, should certainly put that topic to rest, in my opinion. A great day for hockey, a great day for Yager, and a great day for Pittsburgh. Todd, I'm not here to rain on that parade. I'm not. I'm coming at you in the opening segment with what's still the most pertinent thing to come out of yesterday, specifically yesterday, and that's that this team is in trouble. This team isn't just in trouble for the next couple of weeks. This team isn't just in trouble heading into the trade deadline. This team could be in trouble for the foreseeable future. If better decisions, if bolder decisions aren't made, and I mean very, very soon. But the ceremony itself, uh, how do I put this? That's the team of my childhood pre-reporter days, pre-having to be super professional and all that other stuff, that's my team. And when I say my team, my team wasn't just Mario and Yager and all the obvious guys. My team was some of those other guys standing there. Paul Stanton, Shell Samuelson, Yuri Hardino was there, came 4,000 miles. And yeah, 68 put on a show, didn't he? With that speech, with how he winged it, with how he just blurted stuff out. The line about the the young girlfriend was, wow. All of it was wonderful. All of it was first class. None of it moved me, though, quite as much as one specific line. And that was when Yager acknowledged, and I like this part too, people who couldn't be there but really wanted to be there. He mentioned, among others, Rick Tockett, for example, who's currently coaching a very good Vancouver team. He can't just you know get up in the middle of the regular season and go flying all the way across the continent for something like this. But he also mentioned, and he underscored it with the, the words, my friend, Marty Straka. Now, this was into my reporter years. I was on the everyday beat at the time for the Post-Gazette covering... That really, really check-heavy team that they had, Yager and Straka and Robert Lang, who was able to make it there, and Yuri Slager, who was able to make it there, who once fell asleep on my shoulder for a 13-hour flight to Tokyo as Yager and the Czechs came back to that part of the plane and were taking pictures of us for posterity, giggling like schoolgirls. But even that wasn't what got me. It's that as soon as Yager mentioned Straka's name, the crowd burst into applause. If you were there, you know what I'm talking about. And you had to have felt it too. Because every single individual who did that knew about Marty, and they didn't just know about it because Marty was on about half the highlights that were getting shown through this ceremony. They just knew Marty. They remembered Marty. They loved Marty. And that, as much as anything I've experienced in recent years, reinforced for me how very deeply ingrained in our city, in our region, the beautiful sport of hockey has become. And then in turn, how much of that is owed to so many of those extraordinary individuals, those champions who were down there at ice level. And because, Todd, I've just got to be me, I'm going to end this by saying that if Riley Smith or anybody else on this roster doesn't want to be part of that, there's the door, man. There's the door. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. We're going to do another one of these tomorrow, I promise.